Hello. Hi. Um, okay. Great. Hello. <laughs> um, so uh, with that, um, so our next talk, everyone, is uh, Dask on Ray, using Dask for large scale data processing on Ray. Uh, our speaker is Clark Zinzo, uh, a software engineer at AnyScale who works on Ray and its ecosystem. Uh, so with that, uh, we are recording, so I will mute myself, hide myself, and then you have the floor. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Hello. Uh, very happy to be talking to you today. Uh, can uh, you all see my screen? Or I think I need to share. Yeah, here we go. Let me share. Okay. I think everybody can see this. Uh, so yeah, this talk is on the Dask on Ray integration. It's a way to run uh, the entirety of the Dask ecosystem on top of Ray. And it's one of, uh, one of Ray's big ways to do large scale data processing on top of Ray. And so what is this talk exactly about? Um, it's about the, uh, core motivation for the Dask on Ray integration, uh, integration um, for which there are essentially like two big points. It's um, uh, providing a compelling option for doing large scale data processing uh, other than uh, Dask distributed. Um, it, it's often a pretty nuanced choice on which to choose. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, but it's, uh, I would say it's more about trying to find a way to join these two uh, it's super awesome ecosystems. Uh, Dask with its very broad uh, selection of like data processing abstractions and libraries, and then Ray with an ever growing machine learning ecosystem. Um, and marrying those is basically, I think, a big win for everybody. So, a little bit about me first. Um, I'm a software engineer at AnyScale. Uh, AnyScale is the company that uh, it came out of the Berkeley Rise Lab that was formed around Ray and its surrounding ecosystem. Uh, and we're still a startup. I'm working on the core Ray system, primarily focusing on supporting uh, large scale data processing. Uh, so anything that needs to be uh, anything that needs to be fixed or improved within the core Ray system to support super massive data scales. I'm all about that. Uh, before any scale, I was actually a Ray and a Dask on Ray user. At the uh, last startup that I worked at, Descartes Labs, we were using Dask and wanted to try to find a way to run Dask on top of Ray for really large distributed workloads. Um, and that's when I uh, contributed Dask on Ray to the Ray ecosystem and started using that. And also right now, currently, I'm in an Airbnb trying to find a place to rent in the Bay Area. So a little extra about me. Uh, please help. <laughs> it's very, very difficult so far. Um, yeah, just, yeah, if you got any pointers, that'd be great. New to the area. Uh, so why do we need Dask on Ray? Why even do this? What problem are we actually solving? I, I see it as two big problems. Um, number one, just, uh, we have two disjoint ecosystems. Dask has awesome data processing stuff. Ray has some awesome machine learning stuff. Both ecosystems continue to grow. But unfortunately, as a user, if you want to uh, if you want to use both uh, stuff from the Dask ecosystem and the Ray ecosystem, you have to run two separate clusters, uh, which then uh, it both it, it's a huge operational burden and it's also a point of inefficiency when you have to transfer data from one cluster to the other. For example, when going from like data pre-processing uh, to model training, which is you know that's no fun. Nobody wants to do that. Uh, and the other big one is providing a compelling option for super large scale uh, data processing. So basically Dask on Ray being valuable in its own right, even considered like totally isolated from the two ecosystems. Uh, so Ray's support for large scale data processing has continued to get better and better. We've been working a lot on that, uh, even before the Dask on Ray integration was a thing. Uh, but un <laughs> unfortunately, implementing uh, these like front end collection abstractions like uh, multi-dimensional arrays and data frames 
implementing that API surface on top of Ray, it's a ton of work. Um, and uh, we don't have the engineering, uh, we don't have the engineering uh, resources to take that on. And, you know, like other libraries in the ecosystem have been, have been working on that, you know, over the course of like the last decade. Um, and so if you ever want to see how crazy this is, you know, to just go look at like the API surface that, that the desk, uh, like data frame and, and array collections cover. It's nuts. It's a lot of work. So a solution to these two problems, disjoint ecosystem, and then uh, trying to provide another uh, large scale data processing solution uh, that has to be done on a multi-node cluster is Dask on Ray, where we basically find a way to run Dask on top of Array cluster. So this solves the disjoint ecosystems problem uh, by unifying those, those uh, two ecosystems by using Ray as the shared compute substrate of both any Dask workload and any Ray workload. It can all run on top of uh, a single Ray cluster. So you only need to deploy and operate a single cluster. As for large-scale data processing, um, by running Dask on top of Ray, we can benefit from the, uh, I would say, thousands upon thousands of engineering hours that have gone into developing Dask's front-end abstractions. And by hooking into Dask uh, at below those front-end abstractions, we can benefit um, from that API surface coverage and also uh, all of the like heavy optimizations uh, that have gone into making these uh, efficiently like data parallelizable um, and like miscellaneous like task graph optimizations. So by doing this, we automatically get a uh, NumPy API on top of Ray, a Pandas API on top of Ray, and the uh, slightly less used but still super cool and important, um, the you know PySpark esque API uh, with Dask bags. And so just by hooking into Dask's awesome uh, uh, awesome like scheduler API, we suddenly benefit from all of that work of that ecosystem. And it's now, now you can run super awesome large scale data processing stuff on top of Ray. Now, you know, this is great, but it's, it's also like, who's using this? Like, why would you want to use it? What's the use case? Um, one use case that we found interesting is uh, this very large scale X-Array workload that's being done at Amazon, um, which involves processing 3.3 petabytes or <laughs> petabytes of uh, multi-dimensional uh, data and generating uh, like 15 uh, yeah, terabytes of output. And they initially experimented with both Dask Distributed and Dask on Ray. Uh, and then uh, when comparing them side by side, uh, the interesting results that they found were that Dask on Ray, like AKA uh, Ray, the Ray backend successfully scaled up to a seven times larger cluster on AWS than Dask Distributed. Uh, so they are able to add many, many more EC2 instances in their cluster uh, without the cluster falling over. And uh, they also achieved a four times higher throughput for core. And that that's also that per core bit is key. It, it wasn't purely four times higher throughput because the cluster was way larger and it had way more resources available. This was um, at a per core level. Um, so, so essentially like much more efficient uh, resource utilization and higher throughput. And overall, for this particular user at Amazon, this resulted in a nearly four time, 14 times faster processing of their workload, um, which uh, time-wise is it's kind of like an insane comparison of like two weeks compared to half a year. Uh, and even with that much larger cluster, they still saw like a 4X reduction in cost, um, which was huge because this, is also, this workload is also running periodically. It's not just a one-off. And uh, by the way, I'm gonna share these slides and you can check out the blog post for more details on this benchmarking. It was a really, really well done thorough benchmarking, very interesting. So uh, I haven't talked too much about what Ray actually is. I've just been talking about it as like, it's a cluster and a way to execute tasks. Um, so to dig into a little bit more detail on what exactly Ray is, 
Um, in the abstract, it's a task execution engine uh, that is aiming to provide a very simple API for building distributed applications. And it has a couple of key focuses in its system design, um, and those are performance and reliability. And it tries to achieve uh, uh, those two like uh, system design goals by leveraging um, some very smart decentralized scheduling, uh, not uh, putting all of the scheduling smarts in a single global scheduler. Uh, by uh, implementing some, some relatively complex uh, fault tolerance protocols, which are tough to get right, or uh, fault tolerance protocols, which are, which are tough to get right, but once you do, um, you can recover from failures transparently to the user, which the user is always very happy about. Um, and also, a, uh, really what's core to Ray is it's very high performance uh, distributed in-memory object store, uh, Apache Plasma, and uh, we use this uh, for things like, which I'll talk about a little bit later, like zero copy reads, um, very fast uh, object transfers. It's all done by a shared memory. Uh, and it allows us to achieve, well, these three things allow us to achieve very high task throughput, even in the face of failures um, of like nodes going down, uh, worker processes failing for one reason or another. Um, it raises pretty Python centric because it's uh, initially focused on like the machine learning ecosystem, which is very Python centric, but we do have Java and C++ APIs. The C++ API is still experimental. The Java one is a little bit more stable, um, but we're also looking at adding more languages. Uh, yeah, as I said, the ecosystem is very ML focused, um, uh, but we're continuously looking at broadening that scope uh, beyond just machine learning. A uh, quick little overview of the Ray API. It's uh, pretty pretty simple. Um, uh, you would start off by like connecting to the cluster with a Ray data init, and then if you have a function that you want to run on the cluster, you just wrap it with a Ray dot remote decorator, and that will export the function to the cluster and wrap it in this remote object. So when you want to actually submit a task instead of calling add directly, you would call add.remote. And that will create a task, submit it to the cluster, and it'll return a future, a uh, Ray object ref. So this is just representing a uh, potentially like a soon to be materialized object somewhere in the cluster. And uh, the nice thing about this uh, distributed future abstraction is when you pass the object refs into another task, uh, those will be automatically resolved to their concrete value once those uh, that concrete value is available. So you can transparently just pass in these futures into other Ray tasks and Ray will sort it all out on the back end and make sure those are materialized to concrete values. And then at the end, when you finally want your result, you call Ray.get and that will fetch the object from that distributed in-memory object store that I talked about. The Ray ecosystem is uh, always growing. We're we're always we're always adding new stuff. Um, uh, we have a couple of like uh, very like fundamental native libraries. For example, like RLlib and Tune were the very early ones. Uh, Tune is for hyperparameter tuning in machine learning model training. RLlib, as you can imagine, is uh, for reinforcement learning. And RayServe is a bit more of a recent addition. Um, RayServe is for model serving. Uh, and uh, we, we also have like a solution around distributed model training called Ray SGD. And along with that, we have a third party integration with Horvod, uh, Horvod on Ray, which is another method to uh, achieve distributed model training on top of Ray. And so you, you can imagine like, uh, like the machine learning pipeline when visualized as far as having uh, machine learning model training, which can be done on Horvod on Ray, uh, machine learning model serving, which be, can be done with RayServe, and then hyperparameter tuning, uh, uh, very rapid iterative, uh, like tuning of, hype, of model hyperparameters can be done with RayTune. Um, so uh, towards the latter half, obviously we have a pretty good, uh, pretty good coverage of the machine learning pipeline, um, but uh, data processing has been something that we've been focusing on more recently. And for those options, we have Dask on Ray, uh, for we have Modin and then Mars also is a it's a um, like a like an ND array abstraction 
uh, contributed by Alibaba, and they have a, uh, a rate back end. Now, uh, let's get back to actually, after we've done a little bit of survey of Ray, Dask on Ray specifically. Um, and in the simplest terms, it's just a scheduler for Dask that runs Dask tasks on top of Ray. It just farms those tasks out to a Ray cluster. So um, the API, um, which is pretty simple. So if you're familiar with Dask at all, which since you're attending this conference, I assume you are, um, uh, when computing a Dask collection, such as like a Dask array or a data frame, you typically have like a dot compute call like this. Um, so the only API change really is you initialize the Ray cluster and then you set the scheduler to be this Ray Dask get um, this uh, just function that we provide that plugs in as a Dask scheduler. And then from there on, everything is pretty much the same. Uh, you can call dot compute, dot persist, uh, um, pretty much uh, work with the Dask APIs uh, as you're used to uh, without any changes. And this is like setting a global config here, this Dask config dot set. And uh, yeah, that, that's pretty much it. Um, so the, the API change is very, very simple, um, which is which I, which I like. And by the way, big kudos to the Dask community for creating such pluggable, uh, a, a such pluggable scheduler API. Um, this was very simple to add as an integration. Um, so a quick little like more involved example. Um, first, you start Ray. Next, uh, you set the scheduler globally. And then let's say you want to, you're just creating like a random Dask data frame. Uh, so this is creating like, uh, yeah, just using like uh, NumPy to create like random integers. It's gonna have two columns, age and grade, two partitions. Um, and then uh, typical, just of your like, like your normal like Dask workload, it's completely like Ray agnostic after you set the scheduler. Uh, do group by, do a mean, do some aggregation, dot compute, and all of this will transparently submit the underlying Dask tasks to the Ray cluster and then bring them back uh, to your client code here. Um, and bring that result back uh, from the cluster. We also uh, have, uh, in addition to like the basic Dask on Ray scheduler API, uh, which I just showed, we also have a couple of little extra goodies that are particular to Ray. Uh, we have this uh, custom shuffle optimization for Dask data frames. And this is taking advantage of the fact that Ray tasks can have multiple return outputs uh, so to, like for a desk task, there's always one output. Um, and that's, that's like, that's just, it's, uh, it's a single like return output feature. Um, in Ray tasks, you can actually say, no, I want to have, uh, this will have five, um, this will have like five uh, return objects. And then when you submit that Ray task, you get back five distinct futures. And you can then pass those to like, you know, other Ray tasks. And this is useful for shuffle, uh, for example, because a mapper will split its, uh, it, a mapper will, will select a certain like subset of like data frame rows and split those out to N reducers. And how this is typically done within Dask is it will return one large list of chunks and then it'll have a bunch of other Dask tasks that are slicing that list. While in this case, we're able to return each of those individual chunks uh, as like a, a separate distinct return object. And then those are fanned out directly to the reducer. So we get rid of basically a layer of Dask tasks, which actually provided a, a pretty big speed up um, when we were benchmarking some Dask on Ray shuffling. So how this would be provided is similar to when you're setting the scheduler in the config, you set uh, this data frame optimization function that we provide. Um, and then it's, it's all pretty much then like Ray agnostic, except in order for this to work is that anything that will trigger a shuffle, you'd wanna say, I wanna do task-based shuffling. That's what the shuffle equals tasks is. And then you wanna set this max branch parameter uh, to essentially infinity and that's to a force that it doesn't do like stage-based shuffling, that it just does it all in one stage. 
Uh, hopefully that max branch will no longer be necessary. Um, like I'm currently looking into a way of getting this optimization to work well, uh, even when shuffling is done throughout multiple stages. Um, but that is, uh, you know, that's to be added. Um, hopefully I'll get to that at some point. Um, another Ray specific thing that uh, we've added are uh, Ray native callbacks. If you're familiar with the Dask callback API, it lets you hook into the Dask task uh, submission and the Dask task execution lifecycle. This does the same thing, um, but hooks in more directly into the uh, Ray task submission and execution lifecycle, which is a little bit different. Um, so uh, uh, basically, you uh, you have a couple of hooks. Uh, for example, this one will run before submitting a Ray task. Um, this runs uh, after submitting a Ray task, uh, before executing a Dask task within a Ray task. Um, and so basically the Ray tasks, when they are launched, will wrap the underlying Dask task, and then will execute that underlying Dask task uh, within the Ray task. Um, so this is uh, the ability to hook in like right before it's executed, actually like out on the Ray cluster. And then, for, uh, yeah, same, the other side after executing the Dask task within the Ray task. Um, and then this hook is for after all Ray tasks have been submitted. And then finally, after ray, all Ray tasks have finished and the final result has been returned back to the client. So these hooks are useful for implementing things like a caching layer, uh, where you can, before submitting a task, you can check to see if that key is in some, like for example, like a Redis cache. And then if it's if that key is in there, then you return the result directly and you don't submit a new task. Uh, it's also useful for implementing like progress tracking um, where you can do that. Uh, you, can, you can basically do that with like pre-task, post-task hooks um, or like uh, pre-submit, post-submit. And, uh, and yeah, so th this is just, pretty much useful for uh, uh, developers that are trying to provide good like introspection um, or something like a caching layer. And then for persisting, we, uh, we support the, um, the like inline future semantics of DAS distributed when you persist a DAS collection um, uh, where it's like all the tasks are still submitted for uh, computation on the Ray cluster when you call dot persist but it inlines these object ref features um, instead of uh, like uh, blocking until, uh, until the underlying like result is available and, and returned. So this is very useful for you persist um, to launch computation. And then like, for example, if you're in a Jupyter notebook, you'd persist this array after doing some operations on it. And then you'd wanna do a bunch of other like maybe little aggregations on top of this base array. And these will all uh, execute pretty quickly because that base computation was launched earlier. Uh, and it'll just be operating on those features that are inlined in the DAS collections. So we support the DAS distributed future semantics for persist, which I think is nice. Um, very brief, quick overview, since I think I'm a little bit short on time on the scheduler implementation. Um, it's, it's very simple, all Ray tasks by the way, are just like exported Python functions when we do this like ray.remote wrapper of a function. And then given that DAS task graphs, they're under the hood, they're just these like function application graphs of Python functions. Um, so all that we have to do is we convert uh, each DAS tasks Python function to a ray.remote function. Like you just wrap it with that ray.remote decorator. And then there you go. When you go to execute the DAS graph, um, it will just automatically farm it out to the Ray cluster. We've deviated a bit from this very simple, like what, like, uh, <laughs> like four line implementation um, uh, in order to support like uh, things like executing DAS tasks uh, that have been inlined within a Ray task, um, like making sure that that all works nice so we're not unnecessarily creating um, Ray tasks for functions that have been inlined, just respecting like the desk front ends like optimization passes over the graph, stuff like that. So a quick little uh, overview of Ray internals um, in that we've a uh, uh, little, some, uh, these are basically some 
uh, recent feature development and fixes that we've done uh, to the internals of Ray in order to enable large-scale data processing. Um, I'm going to skip through this pretty quick because I know I only got a couple minutes left. Um, the general Ray architecture is we have these Raylets that uh, facilitate object transfer uh, between the nodes and also are responsible for scheduling, um, for scheduling tasks. And then we have some number of worker processes. The driver over here, um, the driver is essentially just a client. You can think of a driver as a client. And so there's uh, it's typically only going to be like one of those. And then there are going to be a bunch of other like Python workers that the Rayleigh can schedule tasks to. And then we have a global control store that contains cluster and task state, like all metadata. And then we have uh, the object store, and that's our distributed in memory object store. And that's for uh, persisting like all task outputs and stuff that you manually put into the object store. And uh, yeah, yeah, so that very, very quick <laughs> overview of that. Um, for the, the, one of the biggest features of Ray is that distributed in memory object store. It, uh, it helps, it, it allows, allows us to like hit those performance and, re and uh, reliability uh, goals. Um, it's really probably the biggest feature of Ray uh, and uh, for example, um, the uh, given that the distributed in-memory object store is all just shared memory, uh, we automatically get zero copy reads when workers on the same node are reading the same object, um, which is which is really nice, especially when those objects are large, uh, with like large deserialization costs. Uh, we also get uh, fast multi-threaded object transfers between those nodes, um, and then when it comes to reliability, the scheduler will limit. Uh, how much total memory can be used by objects on a single node? Uh, it will. Uh, it will. Uh, it, it also. Yeah. It, it. It. It does a lot to ensure that the the node will not run out of memory, including a smart eviction policy, uh, uh, and smart task scheduling. And if that's not enough, uh, we are also able to spill objects to external storage when the local object store is full. Uh, as for uh, scheduling niceties. Um, uh, task scheduling is decentralized, so there's no global scheduler bottleneck, which is uh, one difference compared to Dask distributed. Uh, Ray will attempt, uh, attempt to schedule tasks on the nodes with low memory utilization, hopefully preventing hot nodes uh, that would eventually cause out of memory errors. And then Ray will also try to schedule a task on the node with the most task dependency bytes already local. This is called uh, locality aware scheduling. And this will prevent, hopefully, unnecessary object transfers across nodes. So the big takeaways from this talk are that uh, Dask and Ray joins the Dask and Ray ecosystems onto a single infrastructure. And I think that this can potentially be a very happy marriage uh, uh, with uh, the data processing capabilities of Dask and the machine learning stuff within Ray. Um, I, I think that this is like a an awesome way to have a single shared infrastructure, a shared substrate uh, for, the uh, for the entire machine learning pipeline. That's the uh, eventual goal. And then also Dask on Ray uh, by itself provides a pretty compelling option for running large scale data processing workloads uh, due to its very smart decentralized scheduling um, and the high performance distributed object store. And this second point, by the way, well, uh, really both points, both points will continue to get more compelling as either the ecosystems of both Dask and Ray grow, uh, and also as uh, we continue to improve how smart that decentralized scheduling is and the performance of the object store, which we're, all, we're always working on that. So uh, some quick resources for people who want more information. There's gonna be a uh, large scale data processing talk um, at Ray Summit uh, 2021 in June um, by Sang. Uh, so if you're interested in that, uh, definitely uh, check out that talk. We're going to be releasing a large-scale Dask on Ray Shuffle benchmarking blog post in the coming months, so stay tuned for that. Uh, check out our Living White Paper for more information on Ray internals. A lot more details that I was not able to cover. And then uh, check out the Ray repo and come chat with us on the Ray discourse. And then finally, uh, we're hiring. Uh, you know. Come if you find this all uh, pretty interesting, you know, come work for us. Uh, it'll be it'll be fun. Um, all right, thank you. That's my talk.
Great. Uh, thank you so much um, for that, that uh, interesting talk. Um, unfortunately, I don't think we have time for questions because we're already um, at the half hour. So if anyone in the audience, I saw there were a few questions that were being passed. I highly encourage you to go to the Slack channel. Um, there's a lot more discussion and stuff happening in there and just a great place for these sorts of things. So thank you. Yep. Yeah. Yep, I'll be on Slack. And uh, if anyone has pointers on finding a place to live in the Bay Area, I will also love to hear that too. <laughs> Excellent. Either we got a separate channel for that. <laughs> oh, perfect. <Sweet. laughs> thank you. Great. Thank you, everybody.